Welcome to the second video in the Intro to Micro series. And this video is going to focus on the history of microbiology. As you can see from this slide, microbiology has been around for quite some time. And so this conversation is not going to be super inclusive of every single person and their contribution. What we're going to, I'm kind of dividing the history of micro into two pieces. Uh, this slide is going to focus on what's called the spontaneous generation debate. The next slide is going to be other scientists and their contributions, but they are separate, this spontaneous generation debate. So first of all, let's talk about what is spontaneous generation. So previously, way back in the day, before we even knew microbes existed, right? People could not see them. They did not have the technology required to see them. So people didn't think microbes even existed. And so the big theory is that certain things just spontaneously arise, okay? And basically kind of think of it as being like, oh, poof, there's a fly, right? Because the larval form of a fly is microscopic. People can't see it. So as far as people could tell back then, flies just kind of came out of nowhere, okay? So that's what spontaneous generation is. They would spontaneously generate. So for a long time, that's what people believed. And as you can see, as we go through time, people are trying to say, no, that's not really a thing, okay? And as we learned more about this, quote unquote, invisible world around us, people wanted to really kind of debate this theory of spontaneous generation. So you will not be quizzed or tested on dates. I'm merely putting them there so you can just kind of see how long it takes things to progress. A lot of people think we develop a scientific theory just overnight and it's always perfect and it's flawless, you know, but that's not the case at all. As we acquire evidence, it either supports an existing theory or it's going to poke holes in that theory. And that's why science sometimes changes, right? Those theories change because we want things to be accurate, even if it means we've been wrong for quite some time. OK, nobody's perfect. So this whole uh, the idea of spontaneous generation kind of started to become a debate in the mid 1600s when Robert Hooke reported uh, seeing the first cell. Okay, remember, all living things are made up of cells, and that's part of the cell theory. And so Robert Hooke made his own makeshift microscope at home, and he was able to, you know, look at like water things under a microscope, and he saw this repeating unit, the smallest unit of life, and it is now coined a cell. And like I said, eventually that led to the development of the cell theory, which is how we determine whether or not things are alive. Living things are made up of cells. Other things like rocks, a fork, right, a water bottle, they are not made up of cells, so they are not alive. And so in 1673, another scientist, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, um, also made um, his own makeshift um, microscope, and he collected sea from a variety of environments, like water samples, uh, he did scrapings from his teeth. He even investigated his own uh, stool samples. And he documented, he had tons of journals where he would draw very detailed sketches of what he saw from these different environments. And he referred to these as animalcules. So because remember, back then, things were pretty much, you know, like plants and animals in terms of living things. And so um, that's where the animal part comes from, and cule is like molecule, so tiny animals, essentially. And this was really showing that, hey, there's a lot of tiny things that we can't normally see with just our eyeballs, and there's a lot of diversity, okay? And so this really um, got the conversation going. Um, Frances uh, Francesco Reddy, as you can see, I kind of put them out of order. Um, he, because now I'm going to talk about like experiments. So Francesco Reddy, you know, there's all this information coming out that, hey, there are these things that we cannot see. And so Reddy was like, y'all, I, I don't think spontaneous generation is a thing. In fact, I'm going to show you that it's not. So the, the top image there of the three jars, 
is the experiment that Reddy did. And so he set raw meat into jars, one completely covered, one completely sealed, and one that was covered by gauze, okay, to cut, still let oxygen in. And what do you know? Only the container that was open to the environment uh, developed flies, and the, the one inside did not. And so the, the big deal with this was Reddy said, if spontaneous generation was a thing, then we should see flies in all of the jars, right? And so of course people are not uh, very quick to, um, to abandon what they believe, what they think to be true. And so although Reddy's experiment was a good first step, there wasn't another theory yet for people to kind of latch onto. So people kind of had all sorts of reasons why flies weren't present in these jars. Um, especially for the sealed container, uh, the big argument was, well, there's no oxygen, so of course nothing is there. But when it comes to the gauze, right, he's like, well, there's, there's some oxygen. People argued that maybe there wasn't enough oxygen, but also, you know, maybe some things need oxygen, whereas others do not, right? So we don't know much about this microscopic world, so you know, maybe they have different needs than us. So, um, you know, it, Reddy gave us some good information to work with, but less than 100 years later, John Needham, and he argued for spontaneous generation. I don't have a, a picture of his experiment, but you do want to know kind of what each of these rules did. So John Needham wanted to provide evidence that spontaneous generation is correct. And so he got a glass flask and he put beef broth in it and he boiled it, right? Because in theory, if you boil this beef broth, anything that's already in the beef broth will die, okay? So he boiled the beef broth, he let it cool, and then he corked the flask. And what do you think happened? Bacteria and microbes were able to grow in it. And he said, see y'all, I boiled this flask, once it cooled, I sealed it, and things grew. How is that possible? It must prove spontaneous generation, right? Where else did these things come from? And so we know now, right, that by letting the flask cool and being exposed to the elements while it was cooling, microbes from the air got into it. So when he sealed it, he trapped those living things that, since, that had gotten into the flask since it was boiled and allowed them to grow, okay? But again, back then, we couldn't prove that. So Needham really kind of rekindled that idea of spontaneous generation. A lot of people believed him. About 50 years later, um, Spallanzani, you know, we learned a bit more in there. Like I said, I don't have every person on this list. We learned a bit more about uh, microbes and things. And so he said, I'm going to redo Needham's experiment, but I'm going to make one important change. So what Spallanzani did was he got those same type of flasks, he poured in the beef broth, but he corked it, he sealed it off, and then he boiled it. That way he did boil and kill any microbe that was already in the beef broth or the flask. And because it was sealed off when it was boiled, nothing new could get in. So Spallanzani's beef broth never grew anything. It remained sterile. And so this was good evidence that spontaneous generation is not a thing. Because if living things could just magically appear, then they would have appeared at some point when the, when the broth had cooled down. That didn't happen, okay? So make note that Needham and Spallanzani did very similar experiments. Spallanzani just sealed off the uh, flask before boiling it, whereas Needham did not. But at this point, y'all, people are still not wanting to let go of the idea of spontaneous generation, likely because there was no competing theory, okay? That's where Rudolf Virchow came into play. He did develop the concept of biogenesis, meaning that living things come from other living things, okay? But he didn't have any um, concrete proof, but it at least provided a theory 
for people to start working on, right? If we have a theory, we can try to develop experiments and technology to prove that theory. And eventually, not long after, Louis Pasteur did officially completely disprove spontaneous generation. And he did that by doing an experiment similar to Spallanzani, okay? Because what I forgot to mention is that with Spallanzani, those people that, you know, didn't want to let go of the idea of spontaneous generation, their big argument was there's no oxygen, okay? If you sealed that cork and you boiled it, there's no oxygen in there. So, of course, things couldn't spontaneously generate. They didn't have any oxygen, okay? So, what Louis Pasteur did is he copied Spallanzani's experiment, but he used these special S-necked flasks that you see down at the bottom. So if you look at the very first S-necked flask, um, you'll see that it's open on one end right here. So that's allowing oxygen to get in. Because again, remember, this is people's big argument. And so he has beef broth in the flask. It's open at one end, okay? And he boiled it and he waited. And what do you know? Nothing grew. Now, don't get me wrong, y'all. Because the flask is open at one end, air could get in, bacteria could get in, right? But bacteria couldn't climb up this hill to get into the broth, okay? So as you can see in this picture, this little curve here, kind of like the curve of a sink that collects water, um, anything that did get into this system was trapped there, okay? To further make his point, he took these sterile broths that had already been boiled, that nothing had grown, he broke the top of it and allowed air and microbes to get in, and what do you know, within a day or two, growth occurred. So he essentially showed that spontaneous generation is not accurate, but he also showed that there are bacteria in the air. Okay, they're all around us because when he broke open this flask, all those microbes got in and then we saw bacterial growth. So Pasteur has done a lot for microbiology. Okay, not only did he finally disprove spontaneous generation, he developed pasteurization, which is how we um, drastically decrease the number of microbes in things like milk. Um, he also discovered fermentation, which we're going to talk about later in the semester which is how, you know, under anaerobic conditions, which means there's not oxygen present, um, organisms can um, do fermentation, which we use to make bread and wine and things like that. So let's go ahead and talk about other scientists. So again, we're now stepping away from that spontaneous generation debate. Um, there was somebody named Jenner, who in the late 1700s, um, he was a medical student studying cowpox. And he noticed that milkmaids that deal with cows would develop cowpox. And those same milkmaids were never getting infected with smallpox when a lot of other people were. And so his theory was that by getting cowpox, it helped kind of build up your immunity to smallpox. And so Jenner did something that was very unethical. He um, tested this theory and he gave a child cowpox, which gives big blisters on the hands, but it is, is safe. It's not fatal. Um, the child recovered from cowpox, and then he gave, he um, inoculated the kid with smallpox, right, which would never fly today. Horrible. Um, but it turns out the kid never got sick because the cowpox had developed his immunity towards smallpox. Now, y'all, this is a very lucky thing. It just so happens that the virus that causes smallpox looks a lot like the virus that causes cowpox. And so um, our immune system is able to recognize smallpox and cowpox um, after just exposure to, to cowpox. And that's not normal, okay? Um, really, he just got pretty lucky. And it is lucky for us, though, because it did show us that by doing things like vaccinations, and introducing part of a pathogen to our immune system, it can essentially prime our immune system for when we do encounter the full-fledged virus out in the real world. Okay, so Jenner really kind of got the idea of immunizations going. 
The next few people summarize and lister. They're more about developing aseptic technique, which we're gonna talk a lot about in lab. And aseptic technique is basically where um, you are doing things in a, you know, you're keeping the environment sterile, you're keeping yourself from getting contaminated, you're not contaminating, you know, other media, or in their case, patients. These were both surgeons. And Semmelweis noticed that a lot of people were dying from childbed fever. So basically, back in the day, um, doctors or surgeons would, you know, do autopsies on dead people, and then go straight into delivering babies. And then they go do autopsies, and they deliver babies. They weren't washing their hands, they weren't sterilizing equipment, okay. And so women were dying because the bacteria and stuff from the dead bodies were, you know, getting into their bodies and they would die from it. And so Semmelweis started having surgeons wash their hands in a chlorine solution in between patients. It actually offended a lot of doctors at that time, right? They don't be told what to do. They don't want to be told that they're the reason people are dying. And, but they found that once they started washing their hands with the chlorine solution, women stopped dying. Okay, Lister then took it one step, took it one step further, and started using um, phenol to sterilize surgical equipment um, in between procedures and patients, and also using phenol on wounds before they would cut somebody open. So again, the number of fatalities were drastically decreasing. We're going to talk about coke um, a bit more um, in lab, but coke was competing with Pasteur to prove germ theory. And germ theory states that these microbes, these small and tiny things, can actually cause disease. Because back then, people often thought people got sick because they made poor life choices, right? They're being punished by the gods. And Pasteur and Coke were like, um, maybe not. Maybe it's these tiny microbes that are actually making people sick. And so they were both competing to try and prove that you know, this one bacteria causes this one disease, for instance. And Coke ended up winning because people in his lab developed auger plates. These, these form of um, solid media that we can grow and culture bacteria in the lab. And that allowed him to win this race because you know, he was studying anthrax and the bacteria that causes anthrax is called Bacillus anthracis. And they could re uh, recover Bacillus anthracis from an anthrax patient, but they couldn't grow it up in the lab, which they needed to do because they then needed to infect a healthy animal because that healthy animal should then become sick, right? If you introduce the bacteria to them, but without growing something in the lab, they couldn't do that, okay? They couldn't prove um, that the, the healthy animal had been infected. And so once somebody in Koch's lab um, named Hesse, who's a female, actually suggested they use auger plates, they were able to grow the bacteria in the lab. They were able to um, intentionally infect a healthy host. They saw that host got sick. They could, again, extra extrapolate the bacteria from that newly sick animal. And voila, there was evidence that that bacteria had caused that disease. Okay, so Koch provided that uh, key piece of data to say that yes, microbes can make us sick. Um, Earl Rick is somebody we'll talk about um, in a much later time, but he developed the theory of selective toxicity. And basically that means we want drugs, antibiotics to be toxic, right, and lethal, to the pathogen, to the bacteria, but not to the host, right? We don't want to also get sick when we take an antibiotic. And so Earl Rick is one that worked really hard to find drugs. Um, they were studying syphilis at the time, um, a drug that would kill the bacteria, but not harm the patient, okay? And so we still use selective toxicity today. What we give somebody as a form of treatment, we, it needs to be more dangerous for the pathogen and hopefully not too dangerous for the host. And then the last person is Fleming, and he, um, I think he like went off on vacation or something, and he was studying bacteria, and he had, you know, grown some bacteria in the lab on these little auger plates. When he was away for a while, um, the plates were just left out at room temperature. When he came back, there was fungus growing all over these plates. And rather than just throwing these plates out, he looked at them, and what he observed was that a lot of the bacteria could not grow right up against the fungus. There were kind of these like 
areas between the fungus and the bacteria. And it turns out that the fungus that was growing on these plates was a, um, a penicillin species. And so the fungus was naturally producing the antibiotic penicillin, and that was preventing the bacterial growth. And so Fleming, um, his research then kind of developed um, into finding different uh, living organisms that naturally produced antibiotics. And so he kind of got uh, that ball rolling. Thank goodness, right? All right, so let's wrap up with um, checking your understanding. So again, I recommend you pause the video here and do your best to um, answer these with just your brain and then go back and check yourself with your, with your notes. So I'm gonna go ahead and go through these real quick. So Reddy was the one who placed decaying meat in jars to disprove spontaneous generation. Remember, he was the first one to really try and attack that theory. It wasn't until Virchow um, developed the theory of biogenesis that people started to kind of abandon that idea of spontaneous generation. Remember, biogenesis um, is the theory that living things come from other living things. The next uh, scientist here, Hook, remember he was the one to make his own microscope. And so he is the first person to report the cell, which is the smallest unit of life. Pasteur did a lot of things, but uh, the answer on here that works is H. He used S-necked flasks to completely and finally prove spontaneous generation because it allowed oxygen into the system. Um, he boiled the uh, beef broth and nothing grew. Remember, then he broke the flask and that allowed microbes from the air to get in and eventually there was growth. So he also proved that there are microbes all around us. All right, number five, Van Leeuwenhoek. He did G. He made his own microscope and he, remember, collected samples from different environments, his tooth, stool, water, whatever, and recorded what he saw. And he called all those tiny things animalcules. Robert Koch uh, provided evidence to support germ theory. And he was only oops, um, able to do so because um, Hesse, was a female that um, suggested using auger, which is a solidifying agent, uh, to make media in the lab, which allowed them to then grow bacteria um, in the lab. Um, Fleming then accidentally discovered penicillin. Remember, he's what had the fungus on the plates. And then Lister um, helped develop aseptic technique, and he did so by using phenol during surgeries to sterilize equipment. And they saw that um, the number of patients dying um, possibly decreased. All right, y'all, that is it for this video. Let me know if you have any questions.